you all came to be collaborators? Jenny and I met on Malcolm Island in um, 2015 or 2017. And we, yeah, I, I met her on the beach and we started talking and uh, she told me about her work. And I was really intrigued by this idea of you know, her walking through the forest and collecting sounds. And I felt that was very similar to what I felt like I was doing with images. Yeah, just in a different medium. So we started having conversations and uh, it really grew over time. So we, there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of emails. We already did two shows together in the past years. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really nice. I feel like we are growing together more and more. And the, the longer we work together, the more we understand each other and the more elements we added. This year I was introduced to Jojo by Jenny, and that is your story. How did yeah. you guys meet? I was volunteering <laughs> at Vancouver New Music 15 years ago, and I was reading Italio Calvino, and then Giorgio came and talked to me. Which, do you remember which book it was? Uh, Invisible City. Invisible City, yeah. And here is just this beautiful <laughs> read, <laughs> read books. Read <laughs> 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 Calvino. I even met. <laughs> and so we started talking about Calvino, the language, and, and then we talked about Nina Kundera. Mm -hmm. And then I remember one thing that I, I think I mentioned to you that time, because we were talking about many things, but I think that I think ca captured my, my imagination with Jenny that she was uh, extremely uh, imaginative in, in the way she was associating things and thoughts. And, which I love because I, I'm not a linear kind of person, so going for association and just wandering around this idea, it was wonderful, wonderful. And then I think, you know, and I thought I asked if you remember that there is a, in Milan Kundera uh, the unbearable likeness of being a scene in which the character, I don't remember the name, but the person is in New York and uh, <clears throat> Milan Kundera write about the personal thoughts of this person in New York realizing how beautiful it is, but how actually this beauty arises from a total unintentionality. There is no plan to build this beauty, it just arises from growing of you know building or situation. So this idea of unintentional beauty was really so I think I share with you this because for me it was very important to at that time to to kind of focus on this idea in terms of uh, letting go of uh, the heritage of my personal uh, background, Italian culture or really European culture, in which everything is very much often about me, 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 myself, my beautiful ideas. And this idea of originality is something that is, uh, I don't know what, but, uh, instead of thinking uh, sometimes that this level of beauty and attention is not something that we necessarily build but it just uh, gifted to us from the very beginning. And, uh, and so we went on, and, and then we continued mm -hmm. to talk about books and music, and you were coming to concerts, and, and then we did something together mm -hmm. just to the mm -hmm. yeah. first time. Yeah, with the wooden with the resonators. resonators. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then many other things. But, and the fact that also Jenny has been in this practice of listening, very intense practice of listening, is, and I share absolutely the same thing. I mean, I like to talk, but I, I, don't, I don't talk too much uh, when I want to do something that engages my imagination, because words are very distracting in any language, and uh, moreover, I have a hard time to use words these days, because I don't really know what to say. I'd rather, I, I'd rather behave according to a specific... No, like, I think uh, both Sylvia and Jenny can share this idea. I think for, for a person that engages in, in a, in a uh, relationship with your creative uh, spirit, right? uh, you find a place where 
words are kind of meaningless. I speak for myself now, I don't want to, in a way that uh, uh, if I listen to the sounds, I don't need to explain, I just uh, enjoy the, the quality, the memory, the viscerality, the resonance that is both physical and psychological, the, the tactile quality of, of that sound, and so many other things. You see, I don't like to speak, but I like to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> political discourse in the way it's practiced these days, but my work is very political in that way. Uh, meaning the root of my work is uh, to try to create a space where people gather to uh, create their own soul as a community through sound. And sound, again going back to Latin, and there was a, a nice friend there. Latin, in Latin there is uh, the word persona, person, you know, you are a person, we are persons, but the root of that word in Latin is personum, means true sound. So we are true sound. Now the sound is just a, an analogy, not necessarily the physical sound, but the sound is a resonance. We have a, a sounding presence and a resounding presence too. So sound can be extremely important for change. And even if you don't know, you are actually engaged in a sort of a, beautiful exercise of imagination and resonance with this beautiful painting, the symbolic quality that something happened to gain because a sound suddenly light up some association. And it's very subjective, but the changes are always possible. I mean, I'm, I don't have an agenda saying you have to change this way, but definitely you tend to create a space where those changes are always possible. So is there a political impetus in your work? Sorry? Is there a political impetus in your work? Yeah. Well, I was just, something that is, uh, when you ask that question, can sound make someone act? And then Sylvie's baby is crying in the background. <laughs> and uh, of course, I mean, I'm sure how, how much of you is not, uh, is just like not allowing yourself to act. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just a simple, a simple sound, uh, just an example of that, you know, a baby crying compels someone to act, right? And Sylvia, I think, is currently now <laughs> holding herself so she doesn't act. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. When, when did each of you decide, when, when did you find your medium? in terms of what you wanted to use as a method for you creating your art? Like when did you be, got, decide that sound was going to be your thing? Or when did you decide that drawing is going to be your thing? Or has that even happened? Does that need to happen? Yeah, it's weird because then um, I call myself a sound artist because you have to have a definition, right? right? But um, uh, I don't know. I don't know when that happened. I think I just was interested in sound. And I'm interested in listening and interested in storytelling. And then sound was the medium. I don't know really why that was. Maybe it was it's something to do with like <laughs> some sort of childhood thing. I'm not sure, <laughs> right? Um, uh, you know, if there's, I have writers in my family, I have. Um, so maybe I wanted to explore my form of storytelling through through a sonic medium instead of writing. Um, and for me, it was it felt like I chose it. I don't think, yeah, I don't just actively decide. It just it was very natural. I, think. Um, I went on a sound walk with Hildegard Westerkamp, who's a sound guru. Um, that, Giorgio knows, and um, that changed my perception, kind of opened up my perceptual floodgates, and um, and then I was just compelled to 
to listen in a certain way and um, wanted to explore sound more and more and more. And then I found sound with such a, um, I don't know, like inclusive medium. So it's something that can be brought into a living room through radio or it can be an invitation. It's very, I don't know, communal. Um, in like academia, it's something that takes things out of the, lifts it from the written page. Um, you know, it's experiential um, and it's, it, you listen to it, and you know, we talked about this, but in time, right? So it's temporal, you have to experience it in time. You know, unlike a visual um, image, which you could look at for 30 seconds, five minutes, or an hour, um, you know, sound, you're experiencing it through, you know, temporally. So there's just something I like to know. For me, I started drawing when I was a little kid, as yeah. a lot of visual artists do. You take something in your hand and you start exploring the world that way. And I just always continue to draw, and I think drawing is something that's the, the most immediate way for me to get thought onto the paper. I've tried other mediums like oil or acrylics, but I never liked the drying process in this paint. Like I needed, I want to get it out when it's there, when I have this immediacy of an image or a symbol. And um, I was also, I have a background in illustration, which is a lot of drawing and storytelling. So I, um, I've always been interested in yeah, telling stories, and it always seemed uh, easiest through drawing. Because if I would go through things in my mind, I would have one idea, and then the next thing would come, and I didn't have time to wait for something to dry or to do something else in between. And another thing I, I really like about it is that it's so, I mean, as you can see in my work, there's a lot of charcoal and pigment which, um, I mean, charcoal is basically dust, and you can never fixate it, so it's never going to, like, you can always, you can spray it and it so many times, but the, if you touch it, the charcoal is still dust, and you're going to see marks on your fingers. And so, uh, when I work, I and mean, by touching things, there's fingerprints everywhere, there's like little marks, and I always liked that. I never tried to hide it, because I, because I feel that nowadays we're so, like we have all of, we all have our smartphones that are very clean and we're, we're used to clean surfaces, but I feel like that's not life. <laughs> life is not clean. <laughs> and so I don't try to hard, hide these marks anymore, like I try to work with it. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, me and Jenny, during the year, the collaboration is not just coming to a place and do something together, but just exchanging ideas, changing text, or talking about stuff. And Jenny has been doing a lot of beautiful things, and so we've been in touch on and off. And then eventually, an opportunity arises to converge. So I, I would think that we've been thinking about many things and been touching time, maybe not physically doing anything, but when we did, it was like such a very natural way of being. I think there's some actual needed from you. Do you want to go? No, yeah. I, I, have, to go. Go. I have to go. I have to go. I have to go. I have to go. So, yeah, Victoria yeah. 2019 was the very first time we kind of converged into something tangible, a, a collaboration that is like in at the Open Space Gallery. Mm -hmm. 
And then this is our second one, and hopefully there will be more. Yeah. But then we also, you know, I visited you in Robert's Creek. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> yes. we explore it. Oh, oh, yeah, Check we, out the we video. Did, <laughs> we did a bunch of recording yeah. and spent time. Because last, we were talking, actually, Jenny came to visit me during uh, summer 2020, when finally something, we, oh, we can actually see someone. And Jenny came, it was great. And then we were talking about this project, actually. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I started telling you then, or maybe later, that in, during the pandemic, because I live in Roberts Creek, I'm very near the beach. And uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was extremely uh, both saddened and stressed, because my sister is still living in Italy. And at the early at the end of February and beginning of March, in Italy, two, two years ago, there was about 1,200 people dying, pretty much every day for a long time. So I was, I was thinking about this number. I was like, that's, that's I was really not doing very well, and and I spent lots of time on the beach just to kind of really, to refocus on my personal state of mind and thinking about my sister and so forth and. And I imagine, as everyone of you, being a bit confused about who, what's happening, what are we going to do? Are we yeah, we would have. <laughs> and so I'm going to the beach and be sitting down and start playing with rocks, because I love the sound of rocks. But definitely, I, I, it was a way more intense practice. And then I realized how beautiful it was to put my hands in this rock and play with the sound and listen to the different sounds. It was kind of a healing, sort of a sound meditation. And then I started seeing people that were coming in the same beach, because lots of people needed to go outside, as you can imagine. And uh, they were looking at me and say, what are you doing? Well, I said, I'm just playing with the rocks. And some people say, oh, OK, well, have a good day. And, <laughs> and, 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 and some I said, oh, well, yeah, well, just come and let's play with the rocks. They're beautiful. You can do lots of sound, and you can scrape them on big rocks. Uh, and just, uh, just have fun. You know, why not? And some people came, and said, I realized how much, actually, in this simple gesture of reconnecting with your visceral being and in relationship to the ground, the, the ocean Grounded. sound, grounding yourself, was, uh, was beautiful. And I continued to do it. It's like collecting rocks and do some recording and really just embracing the, the resonance of these little things that have been around for millions of years and the shade in so many different ways and colors. And if you pay attention, you know, that you see all these bunch of rocks, you say, well, they're the same. No, they're not. They're all different. You know, it's like, it's like thinking about humanity in a way. How can you appreciate difference as something that makes the difference? How important is this difference is? She is different. You are different. We are different. That's not an obstacle to, to try to overtake, no? At least for me, as a parvenu in this country, I came to Canada because I have an imagination of uh, uh, a country where difference was actually a value and not uh, an obstacle to overtake or attack my country. So uh, we clearly, I have a, a romantic imagination about that. But, but at the same time, because of that, I think you try to act. It doesn't matter if it's not true. I think you can dream about things and then just, you know, just foster your, your imagination accordingly. I don't care if people don't believe in, in, in the possibility of dreaming different realities. If you don't have that opportunity, then why even bother? So stones are great. They <laughs> are. <laughs> but the mountains are stones. There is an intelligence there. Yeah, we were all talking about stones. I think that was the Yeah, then, thing. We, then it, we were talking about the same. Yeah, I was doing the same thing with rocks. And then we were talking about rocks. COVID was a year of rocks. <laughs> yeah. But it was something about, I think, because we were all locked up or we couldn't move and then in, in the ways that we were, um, yeah, I was also compelled to go to the beach and just like hold rocks and touch rocks and um, and it reminded me of certain places where I wanted to go but I couldn't go um, because travel wasn't it wasn't appropriate. Yeah. So there is a beautiful metaphor about thinking about kids and young kids especially that. Uh, 
<laughs> Mother Voices. And I was listening to, to Sylvie these days that I was here because I, I don't have always an opportunity to be near a, a mother with a young baby and for some hours in time and listen to that. But the, this uh, psycho, psychologist, she, she speaks about uh, sound as a touch at a distance. So the mother voice is uh, like a, a, a little infant doesn't understand the semantic, clearly. The structural brain is not articulated enough to, uh, to, to transduce this kind of information, but definitely sound as an extremely, going back to your comment, the power of uh, communication and uh, uh, expression of any kind of emotional state. We can go, we don't have to say things. You know, if you think about a human being at the beginning, we probably didn't have words, you know, we put terraces of various kinds. I have no idea, I would love to be in a place where I don't even know how to speak. And so that idea of sound as a touch at a distance that is always present is not just the physical relationship, but it's also the sound of the mother sound, of the sound of a mother, uh, the voice, the quality of that voice is a physical, visceral uh, presence for the kids and how that is important. So <clears throat> doing those things are so much... Uh, <clears throat> I think people see them in, either in a very scientific way or in a very romanticized way. Uh, but they are relevant in a way we grow as human beings with a certain opening to our senses. It's not just about music or just beautiful things. Beautiful things, I don't even know what they are. I mean, it's more about doing beautiful things, like this one. It's, it's beautiful just to be here spend time together and do this thing. It, just, it makes you feel part of something that is larger than your <coughs> thing and contributing to that energy is wonderful and sharing. Yeah, it's so, uh, for me, it's so interesting to see, it's so lovely to see how the images and the sound, how all of that goes together because, of course, you can have, you can listen and look at each thing singular, but it does change something like having the sound changes how you look at an image, and vice versa. And that is a beautiful thing. It's beautiful, I think, to collaborate mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. such a way. And moreover, these beautiful paintings, they're not just painting in a way, they're also resounding. I mean, they, you can hear sound. Yeah. You know, if you force yourself to get away from this idea of, oh, it's a painting, oh, I'm using my eyes, but just full embody yourself, like fully embrace your physicality, listen, touch, uh, watch, uh, I don't know. Uh, kids are really good at that. Why we lose that? You know, a playful way of being with ourselves in, in the present time is very important. That's why we have our peace. Uh, yeah, just even that. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is our third show that we've done together. And then, yeah, similar to what George just said, there's just a lot of exchange in between. Yeah, a lot of back and forth. Like I said, it's a growing thing. Yeah. How do you balance your needs as an artist with a collaborative show? You know what? <laughs> How do you balance your needs as an artist in a collaborative needs? show? What are you? The needs? Like, what needs do you have as an artist? Yeah. Um, well, needs could be like, what is it that you want to showcase? What message is it that you want to send? How do you want it set up? Where, like, what kind of audience are you hoping to reach? Those sorts of things. Oh, okay. Sure. Well, I, think I, think, I don't know, by talking about it, I think the better I understand what Jenny needs or wants to get across, the more I can adjust and vice versa. It's so much about communication. Mm -hmm. Like being really clear on what you want to show in which way and just staying in, yeah, staying in communication I think is key. Mm -hmm. I think because we have a friendship, um, yeah, it's uh, easier. Or it also could be different. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, we 
I know, lots of WhatsApp uh, voice messages. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that you know explore the show, but then also are just talking about life, and I think that made it easier. Yeah. And I mean, in this particular combination, we both kind of have. I'm the only one doing drawings. She's the only one doing sound. Or he's the only one doing the resonators. So that, of course, makes it easier. It's mm. different than touring like four drawers in a, in a room. But I do have to say that. But. <laughs> but it is interesting with um, the like. I mean, it's been so good, but we've had that process of um, uh, because often sound can be sort of the a sound bite or a backdrop, right? So how, and it's not that way in this show, but you know, um, I'm sensitive to that, right? Like I don't want the sound to be, you know, an accessory yeah. to yeah. to the visual. So it, it's not just like highlighting the, the, um, the visual art, it is art in itself, right? And so um, making sure that it's not ambiance, that's very important for me. And yeah, we've had conversations around that mm -hmm. and sort of developing our thinking around that. Mm -hmm. Because of yeah. course with a painting or a drawing, it's very easy. Like that's the first thing you see, it's the eye catcher. It's like what we're trying to let go. Yeah. Oh, this art show. Square yeah. art, okay. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it takes one has to be sensitive to it. I mean, I'm around and I know a lot of you know, sound artists. Or there is a lot of sound in the contemporary art world, but you have to, yeah, you have to think about how you should give it enough, or think about how to um, best show it, right? How to show it. Yeah, yeah, how do you create a space where people can actually listen? And so yeah. it's ironic with always the art openings that it's like a terrible place for sound <laughs> art. Exactly. <laughs> you can't hear anything. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't do it justice. Like, and thank you for having the minute of you know we're here because it doesn't make sense or um, unless there's some sort of concert or something, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're listening, but um, yeah. So how do you create an environment where listening is um, enabled, right? I think both things. So this is what I've noticed in the past years where. I see a lot of um, multimedia art, and I always, I, I feel like, yeah, like a, like a still standing drawing as well as listening, both requires the audience to really actively participate, that you have to take the time and actually look and take the time to look at something, or sit down and, and actually listen. It's, um, yeah, it's like asking more, it's not, yeah, it's not just in front of a screen and, and you just get fed these things and you can just have it like trickle over you. Not to say that that's all the way it is, but I don't know how you guys feel about it. There's like this part where, yeah, we need the audience too to like engage or to like, um, yeah, be, be present in that way in the show. Yeah, I mean, yeah. a collaboration for me is, is mainly a, an opportunity to create as much as possible a framework where people can enter from many different points. It's not just say, hey, here is the piece of art. It's a, here is a space where you can engage with uh, in many different ways. And we can suggest some of this idea, but I think it's way better if you take that opportunity to create your own personal relationship with what you see, what you hear, how you engage with that. And that's, we are not accustomed to do that because, I mean, I come from music, so I remember being really tired to go to concert because everyone would come to me, hey, Jordi, Jordi, what do you think about the performance? <laughs> I say, why do you ask me? Because you're a composer. I say, well, what do you think about the performance? Why didn't you come to the concert to ask me what I think? <laughs> and I say, well, I, I ask, it's the wrong question, especially for a musician, because I'm biased of all my yeah. way of listening that can be good, but can be also very conditioned by specific, uh, you know, obsession. And so, in, in the same way, I mean, when you go in a, in a place like this one, to clarify that this is a place for you to, to find a, a path. And sure, I think CV work provide already without even reading anything about a very large space of possibility. And 
so why not just take that and read about it and maybe bring more of that into your uh, engagement but for me it is mainly that and, and, and also very visceral I really want to say that for me the physical presence of sound is not ethereal beauty of something in the air you, know, you go into Fino and, and, you know you probably go anywhere where you have big storms and then tell me how ethereal is that sound you know it, it's extremely powerful physically challenging on many levels and I like that I like more of that than just the, you know, <clears throat> the romantic idea the sentimental man on the earth the sentimental man <laughs> Valentine's <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a pump, a pump for blood. It does a good job, but it's not a valentine. Can I say to your question about how you balance? I got to watch these people hold me in the soul. And I've got to say, it was a beautiful dance. You came together, everything was a quiet, wonderful, growing discussion. Mm. Yeah. It was a joy, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really love collaboration. Yeah. I think we all do, so that's, mm. yeah, in, in its truest sense, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can do shows by yourself and do solo shows. Yeah, it's so much more fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're a group. Well, especially after these two years, where I personally suffered a lot of mm. lack of physical interaction of any kind. Mm -hmm. and a lot of you probably did too. So finding, finally finding yourself in a place where you know is beautiful. Right? And realize that all these things also you can give for granted. And so the fragility of this is also important because you realize that you realize how precious is the fact that mm -hmm. we are fortunate to be able to do that and value what you do as a little, you know, especially this time, what you, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, please, stop, because I'm, I'm going for time. <laughs> there's, one thing that, there's one thing that I want to say, because I've been a bit, I'm sure that all of you are um, suffering in, in different ways for what's happening in general uh, in our life and in our distant uh, uh, part of the world and nearby and even in our land or our people's land and what can we do? I mean, you find yourself saying, oh, well, I'm an artist. Oh, okay, great. What you do? I mean, what, what does it mean? What does it mean to be involved with imagination this day? How can you reconcile your inability to uh, make any change or visible change? In, you know, you have a whole aspiration of Work for the better world, work for equality, justice, love, and, and collaboration, and understanding. And those things are really important. And you uphold all these ideas all the time. And then your physical work is here today in Camber River with a beautiful group of people. How important that is. I think it's really important because in, instead of thinking, oh, I want to go travel internationally to present all my resonator everywhere, it becomes a big chore. And Moreover, it's becoming a bit distracting because, I mean, that, again, speaking for myself, if I only focus on a space, I can get to know all my community, I can engage them to do that, and in doing so, you provide not only an artistic work, but you say, oh, I'm doing something that maybe is fostering some way of thinking. You don't force people to do anything, but you allow for other way of thinking to emerge out of that, that an action that is maybe a bit ridiculous, but why? Kids love to play with stones. Why do you get so jaded about playfulness and just attention and, you know, imagination? And, uh, I don't know, lucid dreaming. It's all beautiful. And maybe in, in that we give more kind of value to envisioning something that goes beyond intention. Oh, I would like to do this, but how does it mean, what, what does it mean envision something? Possibilities. Uh, unlikely possibility of association like the one you may find here walking around with these sounds and you know we didn't plan oh now this sound is gonna oh and then gonna simulate that there is no sort of a, an engineering other than we know that the energy that is coming from everyone is bringing some beautiful things that together are kind of 
grow in yeah. a sort of a different form. Yeah, I mean, also this whole wall is something that I planned beforehand. It happened while we were here in the space. Mm -hmm. Like every square, you know, this, or this, or this. And, yeah. Yeah. Kind of a leaning for New uh, associations. <laughs> That's where we are. I'm also curious. Um, I know everyone here is most likely from the North Island, so I'm, you know, I'd love to hear what you guys think about the work. Because it's, uh, yeah, I was inspired by a place that some of you know, and of course, I don't know, this is, this is like a, it's a very subjective, uh, subjective images. And yeah. Yeah, we can talk informally. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Best question. <laughs> <laughs> But also, I want to say that thank you, Shannon, for your beautiful work. But here, this she's a wonderful human thank being you. and super skilled, very generous, and just the right person. Not <laughs> just the person that <laughs> doesn't create any problem, just <laughs> solve every problem. Yeah. And then the man, and the tree, everyone. This gallery is a, is, yeah. a, is a beautiful place. So I, I have to say, absolutely. Yeah.